Um, so to, to start with, um, could you talk a little bit about the work that you are doing right now? I am finishing up a book on three different migratory species of wildlife, common loons, which are iconic species for Wisconsin and other Great Lakes states, woodland caribou, and lake sturgeon. So these are three species that depend on the upper Great Lakes and are migrants, one long distance migrant common loons, one short distant migrant woodland caribou, and one medium distant migrant lake sturgeon. And the three species are all species that mean a lot to people in the region and that we've been trying to restore since the 1930s. There have been very active restoration projects, and yet their populations are, continue to crash. So I'm really interested in partly the history of restoration and wildlife management, but I'm more interested in human relationships to these species and why we've had such a hard time in your American wildlife conservation, restoring them and what we can learn from indigenous approaches to restoration and relationships with these species. So I've been working on caribou for a little while now. I was in Mongolia, got almost a year ago, working with um, the Duca people, their indigenous nomadic herders who have very profound relationships with reindeer, which are the same species as caribou, see them as very close relatives. Um, and yet also you know sell them and herd them and so i was trying to learn from them how recent conservation policies and climate change are impacting their relationships with caribou and also their their livelihoods and i've done some work with sami peoples in satmi in northern europe who also have very close both material and spiritual relations with reindeer to understand how climate change and mining and logging um, and conservation policies are affecting their relationships with these non-human animals and also their futures. So, That's so I, yeah. So yeah, it's fascinating because I am profoundly atheist. I was raised Catholic, but I've been an atheist since I could think through things, but I've, I'm really fascinated and moved by other people's relationships with nature and, you know, though nature is such a huge category with the Great Lakes, with water, and how different people value water and how spiritual values play such a key role in sustaining, you know, their relationships and our future in this watershed. Well, okay. wow, there's a lot there I want to ask you about. Could, could we back up for a second, if you're okay talking about it, and you say you grew up Catholic, but you came to a conclusion of being an atheist as an adult. No, as a child, as I was child. probably eight years old, yeah. Oh, wow. So could you tell um, me a bit more about how you got to that spot? Um, to being an atheist or to yeah. coming to, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Sometimes I think it's just brain chemistry. I, um, I tried very hard to be a good Catholic child. You know, my mother and grandmother were both very devout. Although my mother, who just died a couple years ago, was also very, very um, active politically with Planned Parenthood and the group Catholics for Choice. So, you know, we grew up in a um, Catholic neighborhood, but also in, you know, in a very independent sort of thinking. So my mother required that we go to two religious services a week um, when, church service mass and then one school of religion but she she was perfectly happy to have us go to anybody else's you know just to learn she just wanted us engaged in this and my father was an atheist so my, my mom had you know the charge of religious training as part of their agreement to get married um so i went to tons of my jewish friends um um synagogue and I went to, I had a very close Quaker friend, so I went to their services a lot because I found Catholic mass pretty oppressive. Um, it was it was not in Latin anymore, but no girls were allowed anywhere near the altar and I just found that really hard to deal with. Um, so as a little girl, I was trying very hard to be a good girl, but it wasn't working and the nuns were always furious at me. Um, went to a public high school, but it was school of religion. And then one day I read a little Darwin. I had um, a sort of illustrated guide to origin of the species and Voyage of the Beagle, I think it was called. It was beautiful pictures and I was a little kid, but I read it and it just clicked for me. For whatever reason, evolution made sense for me in a way that religion didn't. And I'm not suggesting they need to be opposed because certainly in Catholic, not doctrine, but perspectives, it's fine to believe in both. But for whatever reason, 
you know, the study of evolution just profoundly satisfied me in a way that trying to study religion never did. So I ended up doing my PhD in evolutionary ecology, studying long-term evolution or evolution in long distance migrants in Zimbabwe. I worked in carmine bee eaters. Um, and ever since then, no matter how hard I try and cultivate a religious orientation, it just hasn't worked for me. So well, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. So let, let's, when you say a, a religious outlook, you use that word, how, yeah. and how do you describe a religious outlook? Yeah, that, that's a great question because, you know, as being raised Catholic and um, that particular set of frameworks was very much about transcending the earth and um, a whole set of outlooks that sees the earth as something transitory and temporal and true meaning aligning and something that outlasts time time and out and is not grounded in the earth and that's just been fundamentally different than the way i see value i just i as um harry middleton a great religious writer um and fisherman wrote a book called the earth is enough as he came to reject his evangelical orientation um and i've just always anything that tries to transcend or see mortality or death is somehow wrong or limited i just it just doesn't work for me so I can, you know, I would like to think I have a spiritual understanding or sense of engagement and embeddedness in the watershed and in the Great Lakes and in place, but it's not at all about transcendence or eternity or something other than things of the earth. So, so what is that spiritual embeddedness? How do you describe that? Um, a sense that in the end, the earth bats last. <laughs> I like the baseball image. <laughs> I, I'm not, I didn't even know baseball. Here I am talking about baseball. Um, no, just a sense that I, that, um, that human endeavors, um, are not necessarily where my sense of value lies. My sense of value lies in the water and the air and the birds and the earth, but it doesn't have to transcend death. I mean, it's fine with me that, you know, the earth will burn out and some hundreds of billions, millions, probably billions of years and the stars will burn out. That's fine. It's completely cool with me that the universe ends. I don't, I don't need a sense that something goes on or, or some sense of God that's greater than all that. But for me, a sense of spirituality is that my own individual life and worries and, oh, we're going to go face to face or remote or online in the month. And how do I, you know, set up this class and, you know, why aren't the students responding? That all that is just short term, limited, and that value lies somewhere else. Okay. So that's, I really appreciate you telling that because that gives me a kind of a good sort of uh, context for the next question I want to ask you. Okay. And that is, as an atheist, although someone who, by, as you say, has some sense of a spiritual connection to the water and the land around us, mm -hmm. as you do your work with people who have a spiritual connection to the animals that you reference, for example, mm -hmm. as an out, quote unquote, outside observer of that, both culturally and religiously, how do you describe that connection? What does that look like? Um, for their connection or yeah. my connection? Yeah, their connection. As you, oh, I, as you work. Yeah. I just asked them to tell me about it. Um, so, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. So with the people that I listen to work with, who work with reindeer and caribou um, and sturgeon and loons, you know, they, um, they certainly have a sense that for example, reindeer people are related in profound ways to human people that were relatives rather than so something that I really rejected with the kind of Christianity I was raised in was the sense of the great chain of being this hierarchy that humans are almost up there not quite divine but that all other animals in fact you just say animals versus humans which drives me crazy I hate that language that everything of the earth is much lower hierarchically um, and the indigenous communities that I've been fortunate enough to, you know, learn a tiny bit of their perspective, see that as, as just bizarre, that they feel like we're, we're all relatives. Um, 
Richard Nelson, um, the great anthropologist who worked with Koyukin people in Alaska, they're Dene people in Northern Alaska. Um, he described it as that they believe or understand a framework of so-called distant time. And it's a set of stories, sort of like the Bible, but also a set of perspectives and understandings that see humans and non-humans animals were once able to shape shift, to change form from one animal to another. And even though we've mostly lost that ability, we still retain this relatedness in ancient time and we can call on that and we need to be attuned to that. So for example, a lot of the lake sturgeon restoration efforts that are being really successful right now are run not so much by the state departments of natural resources, but by the tribes. Um, Kyle Poes White, who's an anthropologist, wrote a really beautiful essay called Renewing Relatives about the Lake Sturgeon Restoration um, on the um, Gun Lake Potawatomi tribe in southern Michigan. And what he describes and his colleagues who co-authored it with him, I'm spacing out their names at the moment, um, Martin Hilgren and somebody else. Else. What they describe is a, is a belief, a set of perspectives that tribal members hold that we are fundamentally relatives with the lake sturgeon and that restoration is not so much about imposing our will on them, saying you've got to come back to this river no matter what, but trying to understand the place of balance in the watershed, a place that um, all members of these interconnected communities can find a place for themselves, a voice can, you know, can go back to their natal streams if that's what they choose to do. But anyway, the, the title of their essay, Renewing Relatives, speaks to, I suppose, what I see from the indigenous communities I've talked with as the core of their spiritual perspective. Okay. So you teach at Michigan Tech University. Mm -hmm. you, I've seen you, you clearly give talks around and different places. I caught your TEDx talk online. Okay. Um, as you present the, this, these ideas and this perspective to non-Indigenous communities, mm -hmm. what's your experience in terms of do they, do they click into it? Does it make sense? Does it not? Yeah, that's a great, I, I would have been really interesting to answer that question if my November 15th talk that John Magnuson was pulling together hadn't fallen apart because he also wanted me to give this talk about the spiritual value of water. And I said, well, I'll talk about the value of water for different communities. And I, maybe you'll think what I'm talking about is spiritual, maybe not. I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, you know, we, we served together in the Lake Superior by National Forum for quite a while, which was a citizens group charged with protecting and restoring the lake and our um, vision statement was water is life and the quality of water determines the quality of life. Um, and I think John saw that, that as a profoundly spiritual claim, but rooted in Ojibwe or Anishinaabe spiritualities, as well as Christian spiritualities. He's a minister. Um, and so that it would have been interesting to see what his church thought of what I would have talked about with this water is life and how different communities from say the water keepers among the Anishinaabe women who walk around the water, walk around the Great Lakes testifying to the need for water restoration because the water is our most ancient relative, not just, not just a resource. People seem really receptive to that rather than whether they're from indigenous communities are from Euro-American communities or Latinx communities as well. I gave a similar talk about um, Great Lakes restoration and ethics and environmental justice down in North Carolina at NC State, North Carolina State. Can you remember, I guess it was a year ago <laughs> before things shut down. Um, and there were a lot of African-American community members and also members of some of the local tribes and then a bunch of you know, North Carolina State is the land grant school and it was sponsored by, co-sponsored across science studies and the ag school. So there were people from really broadly different backgrounds and they seemed into it. You know, I showed this great movie of Jerry Jandro and Katie and their kids talking about why they do what they do to restore the watershed and restore connections. And it's very profoundly spiritual. It's rooted in their ancestors and their belief in the spiritual power of water um and people you know were in tears after watching jerry and katie talk about this um so I, I mean jerry and katie didn't come with me they have this wonderful short movie clip about it um, 
yeah, that's put on by Finn Ryan. He, he's done a series with Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Commission. If, if you Google his name, Finn, R-Y-A-N, you may know his work, but he's just done amazing short videos um, funded, or he does it through Glyphwick, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, about these different projects with restoration rooted in spiritual values by Anishinaabe communities around the basin. They're super meaning. So I don't know when whites that I hang out with watch these, my students, you know, Jerry comes and talks to my class of a bunch of engineers and they're like, wow, how can I learn more? This is so cool. Mm. So I know people seem super receptive. Okay. Well, in your, in your TEDx talk, I, which I really enjoyed by the way, oh, thanks. Uh, and maybe you've done more than one, I don't know, but the one I was listening to. That one. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's you, funny, I can't watch it. It's so hard to watch yourself giving a talk. I'm like, stand up straight. Don't look at the camera. <laughs> anyway, so thank you for watching it. <laughs> I know the feeling. I know the feeling. Uh, I know you must. Okay. Um, so in the talk, you, you told some stories of recovery around forests and fisheries, mining, uh, different species like the wolf. And you, in that recovery and in those stories, you talked about resilience and hope. Could you say a little bit more about what you meant by those? I taught at UW-Madison for 18 years, a big environmental studies, 113, you know, environmental studies 101, they used to call it. Um, um, and it turned out what the students were really calling it was we're screwed 101. But they, <laughs> they, they didn't use the S word, they used the F word. And I'm like, oh no, I don't want to like, come out of this class with a sense of despair because despair you know, doesn't lead to anything. So people would say, well, Nancy, are you optimistic about our future? And the answer to that is I'm not particularly optimistic. I was really optimistic in 2008. I, you know, I watched President Obama yesterday give the eulogy for Representative John Lewis, you know, and it brought me to tears. I mean, he's, he's so tuned in to you know, preacher, to, to speaking with passion and power about deeper values than just making money next year. And I just thought, um, you know, when Obama became president, I was optimistic. And then eight years later, I lost all that optimism. And Things have been worse than in my wildest dreams I ever imagined. You know, just pure, if you're all you're looking at is environmental perspectives from the suspension of the MAT standards, mercury and toxic substances, there's nothing more important to the health of the Great Lakes, I think, or, than getting mercury out of the water. I mean, there are other things too, getting lead out of the tackle. You know, 40% of loons in one study were shown to be killed by lead tackle. And that's something so simple and so easy to deal with. And, the Obama administration, after years of public input, had passed those regulations on federal lands, and then a week later, they were suspended. Our mercury restrictions have been suspended. So many things that affect water quality. Clean Water Act has been effectively, you know, almost suspended. Um, I, one of my colleagues here, Kathy Bosmer, is um, she's with the Sioux St. Marie tribe. She's their water resources coordinator and she's, she's a member of Poto. She's a Potawatomi member, but she's works with the Sioux nation. Um, and just listening to her talk, she's writing this loon essay. We have an essay due on loons this afternoon, but that's fine. Um, and just listening to her talk. I mean, she wants to be hopeful, but she's really in despair that things will get, that, that we can reverse the damage we've done to uh, the Great Lakes in any short term. So I'm not optimistic necessarily. Well, I guess I am. We'll see what happens on November 3rd. But I, you know, I'm really afraid that we're a deeply divided country and environmental values were something the parties held in common. You know, I tell my students some of the most important environmental reforms in this country were headed up by Republicans. You know, Governor Milliken, who just died, was one of the great governors for protecting the Great Lakes and he was a Republican and you know Nixon he didn't particularly want environmental reform but it was politically useful for him and so we you know our greatest environmental reformer as a president was arguably Nixon even though he couldn't have cared less about clean water and he actually vetoed the Clean Water Act but it got through so you know I certainly hope we get back to that kind of bipartisan collaboration on water issues but my hope doesn't lie there I think my sense of hope lies in um, a sense that even if humans are completely messing things up, even if we might have passed our window of opportunity for really effective action on climate change, even if we're frozen 
are locked into a certain degrees of warming, which will be very hard for people to thrive under. My hope comes from a sense of, um, you know, the earth will thrive regardless of what we do. Massive transformations in the past were followed, you know, such as massive extinctions, such as the end Permian mass extinction, somewhat 250 million years ago, when 98% of life on earth bit the dust, you know, you know, really intense climate change at that point that was acidified the oceans, led to massive extinctions, mass speciations followed. I mean, over 100 million years, it takes time. So that gives me hope that evolutionary processes will help the earth, you know, help species evolve, you know, new fascinating responses to these dramatic changes. Um, but my nephew always says, Nancy, that's not really hopeful. <laughs> what about us? What about me? Am I going to be able to find a job and have kids and drink the water? You know, I live in Michigan. What's happening to the lake? I can't swim. Let's talk about human hope. Um, and I think that's a more complicated question. So what I told Dave is that um, it may seem perverse to be hopeful right now because there's not a lot of evidence supporting that. But I also think that um, I kind of owe it to the Great Lakes to be hopeful because hope allows you to keep acting and despair, I find kind of freezes you. I'm not giving a very good answer. I, I feel like I have to be hopeful. I feel like I have to believe in resilience. The indigenous restoration efforts are pretty hopeful and you know, examples of resilience, but you know, People can't do it on their own. The tribes can't do it on their own. They just don't have the money or resources to do it. It takes, it takes a wider commitment than just that one group. Yeah, it takes a much bigger commitment. Um, you know, and members of Cliff Wick, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission continue to do extraordinary efforts to restore the lakes, to clean up, to restore species. I'm fortunate enough to be on one of their committees um, that we meet once a month to talk about extractive industries and the pipelines and mining projects. Um, and, you know, I'm always astonished at what they do. And this is a collaborative effort. So there are members of the agencies, the federal agencies, state agencies, tribal agencies, and that gives me hope they're underneath the very top layer of chaos there's still you know massive numbers of people really trying to go above and beyond their jobs i mean they do their jobs but they also really really love the lakes and the species that inhabit this amazing great lakes ecosystem so that's hopeful people still care mm -hmm. no i find that to be very true very at least well there's a lot of them a lot of us out there yeah, yeah absolutely